Welcome to my podcast for the Jews and Judaism class on the interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Uh, the song you just heard is uh, by Spinvis and it's called the Zevende Nacht, which translates to the seventh night, uh, referring to the seventh night after God created the heavens and the earth. And I admire this song for its melodic beauty and music. Uh, the reason that I played the song for you is because of its interpretation of the creation story subtly woven into the song. And it inspired me to think about how many different perspectives of the story of Adam and Eve are actually out there, rabbinic or non-rabbinic, and how those stories play a role in how we view this passage of the Hebrew Bible today. And when I was reviewing some of these interpretations for the podcast, they often seem to have one striking thing in common, that is that they uh, often portray Eve as an object of sort, and especially an object of desire. And this is what I want to dive with you in a little bit further today, how Eve is portrayed as this coveted entity in a range of interpretations of Genesis 1 to 3. And we will look at art and music, but I want to start with the uh, analysis of the medieval French rabbi Rashi. And Rashi intensively studies Genesis 3 and specifically the role of the serpent who persuades Eve to eat the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. And the text in the Hebrew Bible really only tell us what happened, but don't really give us insight into the motives of the serpent. Why does he convince Eve to eat the fruit? And Rashi gives his thoughts on this and explains that his motives were that of desire. He explains how the serpent sees Eve naked and wishes nothing more than to be with her. But standing in his way is the existence of Adam. The serpent knows that God told Adam in Genesis 2 that, I quote, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat it, you shall die. The serpent hopes that if Adam eats from the tree, he will die. And the serpent has Eve all for his own. Well, for me personally, there are some problems here to be found. And Rashi does give us some answers. My first question is, why would the serpent pursue Eve to take the fruit from the tree if he wants Adam to eat it? And, I mean, it would surely just be wiser to persuade Adam directly, right? Well, for this, Rashi gives the following explanation. And he approaches Eve because, and I quote, women are easily influenced and know how to influence their husband. Um, and even though I find this... A little offensive. It does answer my question. Uh, the serpent thinks that going through Eve uh, to give Adam the fruit is the easier way. And he does not actually mean for Eve to eat the fruit. Uh, but then the second problem I have, which is not really answered by Rashi, is even if Adam dies, I would not really see how Eve would want to be with someone else after her husband just dies or even with a snake at all for that matter but then again in greek mythology Zeus has sex with women disguised as an animal all the time so maybe i should not really take it so literally and now that we're talking about the greeks another uh, rabbinic interpretation of the creation story can be found with maimonides who is a philosopher that is heavily influenced by greek philosophy and plato in particular and when reviewing the creation story, Maimonides notes how humanity is composed of matter and form. And this is an idea heavily inspired by Plato, who associates matter with female and form with male. And so Maimonides concludes from this, Eve represents matter and Adam represents form. And you can also see form as intellect. And now Maimonides states how these components are physically inseparable. You need matter for intellect to exist. Um, but they are in tension. Female, the matter inhibits the exclusive focus on the intellect because when there is matter, you have to focus on the matter. And in other words, the female character is merely seen as an object by Maimonides, while the male character is the intellect and is ultimately held back by this female. And when he puts that back to the creation story, he tells us how the serpent represents imagination and imagination desires matter as well because... Imagination needs a body, needs matter in order to exist. And together they threaten the control of reason upon them. They threaten intellect. And uh, this is actually what happens in the creation story because uh, Eve gives Adam the fruit persuaded by the serpent. So the imagination and the matter together persuade the intellect to eat the fruit. And just like Rashi, Maimonides in this interpretation focuses on how Eve is merely an object or better matter. And rather than actually an actual human being with substance, with intellect, with feelings. 
And this is done a little bit differently by Spinfis. Uh, so we're going back to the song. And in the song, he describes the seventh night after creating the heavens and the earth. And he rested on this day. And we find that in Genesis 2. And so in the night after he rested, he uh, he looks at all he's created, especially humankind. And he looks at Adam and, you know, Adam is fine. And then when he looks at Eve, he's unsure. And not because he doesn't like her, but in fact, because she's so beautiful and in the way she walks and the way she laughs. And and as I interpreted, his doubt is grounded in a way that he dwells on the thought that even though he created her, as well as everything else, he still cannot really reach her. And especially when she dreams as she enters this other world of sleep and and dreams. Uh, he cannot, this is a world he didn't really create and he cannot really reach her there. And his desire for Eve is so clear cut in the song, but the subtleness of the lyrics and the beauty of the music make it that it's not, not as harsh and as offensive as, for example, the interpretations of Rashi and Mimonides, who have more yeah, mis- misogynistic tendencies, uh, some misogyny in there. And I can find a more respectful glorification of Eve. And even though I do not agree with the fact that Eve is overly portrayed as a coveted object here as well, I find that Eve de- is depicted in this song with such a soft touch that I can really appreciate. And now going back to the beginning of the podcast where I explain my intentions with the, the assignment. Uh, I wanted to review how Eve is portrayed and I can safely say that she is definitely overly portrayed as a woman who is desired for her looks and no one seems to really think about her as a person, as a whole. And in a way, this is understandable for the rabbinic interpretations that were written about a thousand years ago and feminism wasn't really a big thing back then. But still to this day, songs like the one I played you, but also many pieces of art or paintings or statues depicting this scene tend to focus on her beauty and the elusiveness. And for me, this is one of the clearest and easiest examples of objectification of women. And I'm really, really curious to see in the future how more feminist scholars take take a look at this passage and be interpreted it differently and other religious texts and maybe focus on female characters on more than their looks or poor decisions, but as smart and wholesome people. Thank you very much for listening.